why should we as Americans, as Las Vegans, be concerned about women that are suffering in areas of conflict? And, and then when they come here as female refugees, why should we be concerned with this? Well, I believe that um, many of the women refugees are coming to Las Vegas have suffered tremendously. They have suffered uh, sexual violence, their families have been split apart, and as a human rights activist, one of the most important things is that violations of human rights anywhere are people's concern everywhere. So I think that, you know, as women particularly, we have to support them, we have to care for them. They've been through tremendous ordeals, ordeals that us as women here in America can't even imagine. So I think it's very important to support them. Plus when they get here, it's a whole different world. We have to remember the cultural differences that these women are facing. Um, they get on a long plane ride, um, 15, 16, 17 hours. They arrive after not eating on an airplane because they're not gonna eat some food that is very foreign to them. They arrive here to a city. They may have come from a rural area. They may have come directly from a refugee camp. So I think it's very important that we care for them, we support them, and that they have to assimilate into what's going on here in Las Vegas. And sometimes that's just very, very difficult for them. So I think that that's um, a very important reason why we have to support them. You know, we have to, uh, as women, be as one. And so I think, um, actually, uh, Madeleine Albright said it right when she said that there's a special place in hell for women who don't help women. And I believe that. And I think that's uh, very important here in Las Vegas. And we have a wonderful support system here. So I uh, do think that the women refugees that are coming here are able to start a new life in their host city. The Universal Declaration came about as a result of uh, the aftermath of World War II, uh, the intolerance and the brutality that people experienced um, was just overwhelming. And so the uh, drafters at the UN decided to come up with a set of principles uh, that they really wanted to declare rather than presume based upon what happened in World War II. So we have a set of 30 articles that um, is, it, all of them are extremely important, but the cornerstone of Amnesty International is number one, and that is all human beings are born free and equal in dignity, and that all human beings are born um, with reason and conscience, and they should act towards each other in the spirit of brotherhood. Now, it's really interesting because when the drafters were doing this, there was some discussion about that word brotherhood. Um, they wanted uh, sisterhood, and that was rejected. And human beings was adopted. So I thought that was a little bit interesting. Definitely. So that is our cornerstone. Um, and again, the, the drafters engaged in a set of principles that were to be declared. Mm -hmm. So, um, and that would lead us into talking about basic human rights. Um, I think many people don't know what their human rights are, and that's something that we'll talk about a little bit later, but uh, human rights exist because of the human condition. You have human rights by virtue of the fact that you are human. The state doesn't give them to you. You have them by virtue of the fact that you are a human being. Um, freedom and equality are the birthright of human beings. What is the, the primary goal of Amnesty International? Well, Amnesty International is a worldwide human rights organization. We have approximately three million members. We're in 150 countries. And our goal is to secure the rights and freedoms that are enshrined in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. So we do that through an army of volunteers. Amnesty International is um, an independent, uh, autonomous, organization. Uh, we do not take money from governments. Um, it is supported by its membership. And um, we have three um, kind of things that we do at Amnesty International, and that is uh, research. Our researchers are impeccable in seeking the truth. And um, action uh, and prevention. 
So um, those are really, again, three of the most important things that we do. At the heart of Amnesty International is this idea that we are the most powerful when we stand together as human beings. And one of the things that Amnesty International does is it defends freedom of expression, it protects women's rights, it demands justice for crimes against humanity, it demands corporate accountability. Okay. There's a lot more, but. <laughs> Very good. Can I let's talk uh, about how human rights violations against women is a humanitarian tragedy? Oh, it absolutely is. The scale and savagery of human rights violations right now against women really is a humanitarian tragedy. Um, we see this uh, subjugation to men that prevents women from uh, being involved in the political, the cultural, the social, and um, economic spheres of many countries at this point in time. Um, there are persecutions that are specific to gender, and that's, I think, one of the things that we wanted to talk about today was those very specific harms that occur to women, um, gender-based violence, uh, sexual violence uh, in particular. Um, there is something, the, um, there's several types of sexual violence perpetrated, perpetrated upon women at, at this point. One of them is um, female genital mutilation, FGM. This is still happening, and there are 28 African countries that still permit this to happen to their women. It is um, a cultural idea that is also supported by the women who are doing it. Female genital mutilation is practiced in 28 African countries. It is estimated that 100 million to 140 million women have undergone this barbaric procedure. Um, there are still three million girls at risk every year. And that is uh, just uh, one of the most horrific crimes we feel um, at Amnesty International, and we have lots of people who are working to help uh, combat FGM. Another um, form of violence against women is acid burning. Yeah, um, it's a horrible practice. Uh, in Afghanistan, uh, young girls who dare to go to school um, are subject to acid burning. Um, acid is thrown on their face to disfigure them and to blind them. And it's really sad because uh, the government does nothing to stop the sale of acid. So that's a, a really devastating type of violence perpetrated against women. Um, then in some of the other countries, we have things like honor killings. Honor killings are still happening today uh, across the Middle East. Um, horrible uh, dowry deaths. If a woman cannot pay a dowry to be married, um, she's often killed by her husband. She's often beaten by her family. Um, we here in America can't even imagine those poor women that are suffering all across Africa, in the Middle East, and in so many other countries. Um, honor killings, uh, one of the um, horrible things that happen to women is stoning. So sh women still are being stoned to death. Shocking. Yeah, it is. Um, women are also attacked, and, and this is something well that Dr. Howard talked about. Women are attacked as a uh, deliberate and coordinated effort uh, in conflict zone. Women are attacked in as a tool of war. Uh, war rape has, you know, goes back through the ages, but particularly recently rape has become a weapon of war and an instrument of genocide. 
we see uh, what happened in Darfur. And it was very interesting because um, nine months after the atrocities in Darfur, there was an explosion of babies being born. Um, this was in 1994. So, at that point, the UN decided that they're going to take a look at what happened with the, the systemic rape that went on. And so we have a whole generation of uh, children born of rape. 50% uh, of the households are headed by women in Rwanda right now. So um, it, it's just a horrible, horrible thing that happens to women during war. And again, you know, it's happened um, since time immemorial. Uh, so, and, and, and we're not doing enough to stop it. One of the problems is that, uh, especially in some of the African countries, that soldiers are actually given the order to rape. And once that is done, you know, it, it, is a, it, it empowers them more and takes away the power of the women. Um, and, you know, again, it, it's just a form of persecution that violates your human rights. It's horrific. It's horrific. And, and as you said, it's so far out of the realm of right. our own Right. And, and you know, the other thing I think that's really important is to talk about how armed conflict is fundamentally different for men and women. Armed conflict is experienced by men and women very differently. I think that's a very important point. Um, usually, you know, the men are heralded as, you know, wonderful heroes and combatants. Well, it's the women who are suffering the death and the destruction. The social fabric usually is held together by women. Um, women and children and, and taking care of their families. Um, and so it, it's, it's a really devastating, devastating part of war.